fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We are in the interview part of the show. Uh, joining us is a true crime author that's written several books. His uh, latest book is called Tortured with Love. And it's the true crime romance of the Lonely Hearts Killers. Uh, welcome to the show, J.T. Hunter. Thanks, Alan. I'm uh, excited to be here. Looking forward to talking to you. So, J.T., this is your new book. What what um, what drew you to this story, you know, the Lonely Hearts Killers and, and that sort of thing? Uh, how did you find this particular story? Well, for this particular story, I kind of just stumbled across it doing, you know, basic internet research i don't honestly i don't remember exactly how i came across it but i I do know that i i kind of just stumbled across it uh and read a little bit about you know basic outline of the facts of of what happened and thought it was really interesting i mean it's it's an you know it's a little bit of an older case it didn't happen real recently but the events that happened and kind of the underlying theme of what happened I think really still resonates today. I think the story really still has a lot of meaning today, even though it, you know the events happened a long time ago, because it, you know it has this underlying theme of of, of love and um, you know kind of passion and like what what are people willing to do for those kind of things. So that's really one of the big things that attracted me to the story. Let's talk about some of the basic uh, points. Um, so uh, when did this happen, and, and who are the key players? Okay, so the, the two main players would be Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez. And just kind of a, in broad strokes, what had happened is how these two came together uh, there were, back in back in this time period, the, the main part of the case really happened in the, the late 40s, um, you know, late 40s, early 50s. And back in that time period, there were a lot of what they they called these lonely heart clubs. Those clubs were, is essentially, one of the clubs would have, they would compile a list of the different members in the club, and these would be women, lots of women, and also men, who pay a, paid a certain fee, whatever it happened to be, you know, it wasn't, wasn't anything extravagant, but they would pay the fee to join the club, and then they would get their name listed in the club, and they would get their basic information listed. It was, you know, kind of comparable to, like, like an online dating service today, uh, except, of course, back then, you know, there's no internet, there's no online anything, so... So what they did is they had these clubs and people would write into the clubs after seeing advertisements in different um, periodicals, different you know newspapers or magazines, these sorts of things. People would then write into the clubs to join them. And then once they joined, they would receive a list of all the members of the club and then they would have information about them. And then they could, at that point, reach out to the members and contact them and, you know, see if there's... You know, mutual interest in, in pursuing some sort of romantic relationship or the like. So that is how these two folks ended up meeting to begin with. Um, a friend of Martha Beck's actually signed her up for one of these Lonely Heart Clubs without her knowing it. And as a result, as a result of that, Raymond Fernandez came across her name and her information, and then he wrote to her, contacted her, kind of told her a little bit about himself, and, you know, they started exchanging letters back and forth over a period of time. And then eventually they ended up meeting. And so that's how they ended up getting together. 
Right. Well, what do we know about Martha Beck? Now, she was, um, what, born in, I think, 1920 um, in Florida. So, uh, um, Martha Beck, so what can you tell us about her? She would have been um, about 27 or so when uh, she met met Ray, Raymond Fernandez. But she was born in the Panhandle. Uh, she had um, some older sisters. She had, a, a, I, guess, I guess you would... would describe it as you know not your typical childhood she had some rough rough things in her background um you know she was a good student she did well in school she was kind of quiet um pretty well mannered from all accounts and these sorts of things but she had a a condition that caused her to uh, physically mature very much earlier than girls typically did um so you know she developed breasts and kind of started getting a figure and these sorts of things that attracted, you know, boys' attention and, and, and the attention of men as well. Um, at an earlier age than, you know, a girl would typically have to have to deal with that sort of thing. So she had that happen. Um, she also had some incidents um, with family members as she was growing up. Um, you know, she had the, the family life wasn't a, a peaceful leave it to beaver kind of bliss kind of thing at all. It was, there was a lot of um, fighting between her mother and father. They didn't get along very well. And di- didn't she claim that her brother raped her? Yes. So when she when she was a little bit older, when she was about 13, um, she claimed that her, her brother, uh, Dudley, um, who was 17 at the time, uh, raped her in their, in their house, in their own home there. Oh, okay. Um, he actually did it. He did it. He did it then, and he did it like a week or so later, uh, as well. So that oh, was wow. certainly that was certainly something that uh, that had an impact on her, um, as you as you might imagine, you know, psychologically. Um, she really her self esteem really took a hit on that, and you know, her mother her mother really didn't um, do much as far as comforting her or or you know really being there for her, or kind of quite the opposite actually. Her mother kind of blamed her for what happened basically. And became, um, you know, even more restrictive with what Martha was able to do than what she had done before. And she already, you know, was pretty restrictive, but, but this made it even worse. Um, and, and, and a lot of blame, like I said, from the mother for what happened. She didn't really blame the brother. She blamed Martha for what happened. And, uh, you know, as, as a consequence of that, um, you know, forced her to, to take some kind of weird concoction to make sure she didn't get pregnant and all these sorts of things. So her mother was very controlling, uh, not supportive at all. And, um, this, you know, this is something that, uh, that impacted her, her psychologically as well growing up. Um, in, you know, in addition to the, the rape, she also claimed that, uh, I believe it was an uncle, um, had molested her even at a younger age than that, you know, when she was, um, I don't know, maybe like nine or ten, something like that. She claimed that an uncle had had basically um, come on to her and, and molested her or, or tried to molest her uh, back when she was younger, too. So she, she certainly had these kind of incidents growing up as well. Question, uh, JT. Do you uh, do you think when she was claiming these, she was trying to maybe justify to the court? Well, it's certainly possible. And, you know, that's, now that you mentioned that, but that's, one of the other interesting things about this story is there's so many different versions of the murders that happened in the case that I don't think anybody ever really knew for sure what really happened. You know, see, well, which one seems to make the most sense given what we do know uh, and, and, you know, kind of go from there. Right. So, getting back to your question, yeah, I mean, she, she could have, made some of this stuff up, um, but um, from the best I could tell from, you know, the way that family members reacted to these things, um, it certainly seems like the, the rape with the brother actually occurred. Um, I never really came across anything that seems to pass a whole lot of doubt on that from happening. Right. Were these Lonely Heart Clubs really popular back then, where a lot of people belonged to them? Yeah, I mean, they're back at that time. They were they were 
they were huge. They were big deals. I mean, there was there were a lot of them. They were located all over the country, and they had, you know, each of them had hundreds of rivers. So they were definitely they were they were big time back then. You know, you know, again, I guess again, the, the most comparable thing I could think of today would be you know online dating. These, these matchmaker things online. You know, there's you know, who knows how many people are members of those, but it's a lot. And uh, you know, so kind of think of it in, in those terms back then. I guess, but I, I I would think that they wouldn't. Um, you know, times were different in the in the forties. I'm sure that. Well, maybe I'm wrong, but did they did they meet? And it wasn't like a hookup sort of thing. Like a lot of the online apps now, people are much freer and will hook up much quicker. Um, so back then, it was more serious, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, these weren't typically just kind of one night stand hookup sort of things. Like, like you say, this was this was this was more typically the folks involved. You know, at least the ones that were legit, um, they were looking for more serious relationships. And it seems like quite a lot of them tended to be older women. Oftentimes, they were you know widows. Um, their husbands had. You know, maybe died in the war or after um, or whatever, and they're looking for you know potentially a new husband. So, uh, what can you tell us about Raymond Fernandez? So, Raymond Fernandez had an interesting backstory. Uh, he was born in Hawaii. Um, his father was was Spanish. He was from Spain and had moved uh, over to Hawaii for work. Um, shortly after Ray was born, the family moved to Connecticut, um, and he lived there for most of his adolescence. He lived there in Connecticut. Um, his father, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of a flip, I guess, of Martha's family. And Martha's family, the mother was the, the one that kind of wore the pants in the family. Um, and in Ray's house, it was the other way around. The father um, definitely ran the house. He was, by by accounts, uh, a very harsh uh, disciplinarian, had high expectations, demands. Um, so that that was kind of Ray's home life. And um, he uh, he grew up in this house. Um, didn't really get to experience a lot of um, things that his uh, when he graduated. Um, elementary school, uh, grammar school, as you would call it, uh, instead of moving on with the rest of his classmates and, you know, going on to, to high school and whatnot, um, his father took him out of school, made him work on the family farm, um, these kind of things. And, um, you know, there, there's a story that's, that I recount in the book about when Ray was a, was a kid, uh, he was, uh, I don't know, he was about, I guess, maybe 15 or something. He uh, he wanted to have like a real Thanksgiving, like experience like a real American kind of Thanksgiving, and his father wouldn't have anything to do with it. He absolutely refused, and he told him, you know, if, if you want any kind of thing like that, you're going to have to you're going to have to make it happen, basically. So as a consequence of that, uh, Ray got a couple of his friends together, and they went out and they stole some chickens from a nearby chicken farm, you know, so they could have you know, kind of a comparable to, I guess, a turkey, I guess. But um, so he went out and did that, got caught, of course. Um, his two friends, you know, the, the parents of the two friends came and got them, but Ray's dad refused to, to come get him. And so, you know, Ray went to, uh, went into custody there and at the juvenile facility and uh, ended up, you know, being convicted. For how long? Of stealing, stealing these chickens and had to serve, uh, you know, jail time. His father had him sit in the jail for 60 days, I think the sentence was for. Um, okay. So it's kind of a good example of, of the father-son relationship there, how kind of strict and harsh this kind of relationship was. Um, so anyway, um, as, as Ray got older, he moved to Spain, back to Spain with his mom. Um, the father stayed behind in, in Connecticut for work. Um, and uh, in Eventually, the Spanish Civil War broke out in Spain, and um, Ray got caught up in that. He got married uh, over there in Spain to a Spanish girl. Um, he had a he had a child over there, um, a son, 
and uh, then got caught up in the Spanish Civil War, as I said, um, which was not a pleasant experience for him. He, he was basically forced to fight uh, for one of the sides there for Franco's forces and experienced a lot of bad things, saw a lot of bad things happen um, to his friends and people he knew. And I'm sure that affected him to some extent. Um, and um, when he was eventually after the war ended, um, he was uh, he had an interesting job working for the British as a, essentially as a, as a spy um, during World War II. Um, did some things for them, for them. And then after World War II ended, he uh, was going back to the U.S. Uh, in a ship, and there was a really bad storm at sea, you know, huge waves and everything pounding the ship. And the ship started, you know, taking on some water and things. So he was trying to help out um, with that, and uh, a big wave basically struck the ship while he was doing that. Um, and he was, you know, down trying to help man the, the water pumps. And the the impact of the wave on the ship knocked a, a big uh, heavy metal door like a hatch door, um, down on top of the uh, raised head. So this was like this six feet high door. It was, you know, this thick steel, and it came down and slammed him on the head and, uh, you know, knocked him loopy, and um, he ended up having like a, you know, like a huge scar because it was like a three-inch uh, long scar on, on his forehead, on his head there. He was hospitalized for weeks and weeks and weeks. And this was apparently something that, you know, really altered his personality as well. His family members and people who knew him said that he changed quite a bit after that accident happened. Um, so that's the and, that's the frontal lobes that he got hit in, isn't it? Right, yeah, yeah. And there was, you know, of course, there was some psychiatric evaluation later on that uh, that references that as, you know, pointing to, to something that, you know, re- really could have been an ultimate cause of, things he did later on so um so that's kind of his background i mean one other kind of interesting thing i guess about his background is when he was uh you know he worked on these different ships and on one occasion he he was on a ship uh that came back to the u.s and when it came back in um in, in dock instead of you know getting off the ship he signed up to stay on to to help out as like a steward on the ship to, to help kind of clean up and get everything, you know, back up to what it needed to be after one had been on there for so long. Anyway, so he signed up for that, and then when he got done with that, he noticed, um, you know, the other stewards were, like, packing up their stuff, and they were taking towels and linens and, you know, stuff like that um, and putting it in with their stuff, you know, just, just stealing it, basically. So he saw them doing that, and he thought, oh, yeah, I may as well do that, too. So he, he tried to take some of that stuff as well, and he got caught. Um, you know, and it, it wasn't a ton of stuff, but, uh, but he definitely got caught stealing things and was arrested and um, was encouraged to plead guilty to get a, you know, a lenient sentence. And he did plead guil- guilty, but he ended up uh, getting a sentence of, uh, of a year in, uh, in federal prison, and uh, he served that time. In, uh, in the Panhandle in Colossi, Florida, which kind of coincidentally isn't too far from uh, from Pensacola and Milton, which is where Martha Beck was from. Um, but anyway, while he was there in the prison in, in, in Tallahassee, he, he befriended a, a, one of the other prisoners there who was a Haitian um, who actually practiced voodoo. And so Ray got really interested in this voodoo, um, started reading up on it, um, and... Uh, became convinced that he could, you know, he could hypnotize people and have this kind of supernatural influence on others, um, including women. And, uh, and that's kind of something, something that, that stuck with him going forward as well. So kind of another little interesting aspect of his background. That was uh, after this, this uh, accident that hit, uh, that hit his head, isn't it? Um, and you said that yeah, the yeah, family yeah. member said that his his uh, his personality changed a bit after that. Yeah, they said he he became uh, much more aggressive, had much more of a quick temper uh, than before, and um, and he himself, you know, reported that he, he you know he had uh, he had headaches, severe headaches, off and on um, throughout his life after that. So well, there was. Well, 
What I like about this, JT, is uh, the frontal lobes is where you've got the anterior insula, which is uh, a major component for uh, remorse or lack of remorse if it's damaged. And uh, so that pathway between the amygdala where you get the anger and the fear and that right there, I'm, I'm curious to see if, I mean, some of, I mean to kill somebody, I, I can see if, you know, that pathway is messed up. Some of his life before it, Sounds like there were some ups and downs, but I think everybody has ups and downs. I'm I'm really intrigued by this uh, this accident that he had. Yeah, I mean, definitely, like you said, it, it seems to be a key aspect of what led him to do the things he did later on. It's cer- certainly something that you could, you know, hone in on and say this very likely had uh, had great influence on what happened later on. And do you think that he joined the these groups to manipulate women? Was he that type of person? Well, I mean, after this accident happened to him, he, cer- he certainly changed and kind of became this darker kind of personality. Um, you know, the, the, the way he kind of got into that, he was, after he got released from the federal prison, he went and lived with his sister uh, in New York. And while he was living with her, you know, he was sitting around at her house one day, kind of just bored and thumbing through some magazine she had. And she had some sort of magazine there, um, some sort of like housekeeping magazine or something. And um, he thumbed through that and he came across an advertisement for one of these clubs, one of these Lonely Hearts clubs, and uh, and decided that he was going to join up to it. So, you know, whether he did that originally uh, on the up and up, like he was really just trying to look for some sort of romantic relationship or whether he, from the very beginning, decided that he was going to use this as a way to potentially cash in on this and take advantage of these these older women and things. Um, you know, you can't say 100%, but uh, it, it, it looks like he had kind of a plan from the get-go, um, from, you know, just kind of the, the way the event unfolded. How did the two of them get together and start start doing um, crime, murder? So, yeah, it, it's interesting because before Martha got together with Ray, I mean, there was she had no kind of, you know, issues with breaking the law or anything like that in her background. So... There, there was nothing that you could look to and say, oh, you know, she's going to turn out doing bad things later on. There, there was really nothing like that, in, you know, before she met Ray. Um, so the way that they met was, uh, you know, of course, through one of these Lonely Hearts clubs. Um, one of Martha's friends at the time signed her up for the club, you know, without letting Martha know that. And, um what happened was Ray ended up coming across Martha's information on that club because he was a member of of that particular club. And he wrote to Martha, uh, introducing himself and, you know, saying he's interested in corresponding with her and that sort of thing. And so they ended up um, corresponding over, you know, weeks and months back and forth. And, you know, as they did, of course, they got, you know, opened up more and more, um, became closer and that sort of thing. And the relationship grew, um, this kind of correspondence relationship. And eventually they, they met in person. Um, after Ray um, came back to the United States, he had after, after he had first introduced himself to, to Martha through the, the, the letters, he had made a trip back to Spain um, with another woman, uh, by the way, who he had met through another club. And uh, the woman that went with him to Spain uh, ended up dying over there, a very... Um, questionable uh, meme. Um, oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and, you know, at the time, there, there weren't any charges or anything like that for Ray, but eventually the, the Spanish authorities ended up um, um, issuing a, a warrant for him because they wanted to talk to him about what happened. But by then he was long gone. He was out of Spain again, back in the U.S. Um, so anyway, he had made this trip to Spain, and then he had come back to the U.S., and shortly after getting back to the U.S., he sent a telegram to Martha and said, you know, I, I can't wait anymore. I have to meet you and all this sort of stuff. And so they ended up meeting. Uh, Ray took a train to uh, to Florida, um, to Pensacola, 
in it was in December of 1947. Um, shortly before Christmas, around Christmas time, uh, he came down to Pensacola. Martha met him there at the train station, and uh, she was right away struck by him. Um, you know, kind of on, as an aside, Martha was like a big movie fan, um, particularly of this actor Charles Boyer, uh, and and uh, huh. he was in some of these famous movies back in like the 30s and stuff, including this this film Gaslight. Um, which she starred in with uh, Ingrid Bergman. Um, so he was this kind of this movie star at the time that she was really intrigued by and attracted to. So anyway, uh, Ray Fernandez, he, he looked an awful lot like this guy, this movie star. So when he got off the train, uh, you know, Martha was like instantly attracted to him. Um, it, you know, it, it, was, it was like this movie star had just like stepped off the train, you know. So, so there was this instant, attra- instant attraction by her. Um, on the flip side, uh, you know, when Ray first saw Martha, you know, it wasn't quite what he was expecting because um, I don't think I mentioned it before, but Martha was kind of kind of a heavier set woman. She didn't have, you know, real right. thin, um, you know, frame or anything. She had kind of this bigger frame and she was kind of heavy set and, and, and things. And so uh, it wasn't quite what Ray was expecting. But uh, anyway, you know, they hit it off pretty well. Um, he stayed with her for several days. You know, she took him back to her place, made him dinner and all that kind of thing. And um, see, he would have been about 33 years old at the time. She would have been about 27. Um, and then eventually, he, you know, after a few days, he said, well, I got to go back to New York. I have to leave. Um, kind of made up a reason for having to go. And, you know, she was real disappointed with it. Um, but, uh, but he went back and then he later wrote her and said that, um, You know, he didn't think that they should really pursue a relationship, um, that, uh, you know, he didn't want to, like, lead her on, that sort of thing. And she wasn't very happy to get that, as you might expect. So she ended up going back up to New York, um, you know, unannounced, kind of surprising him. uh, Oh, followed him, followed him to New York. Yeah, she went back up there eventually. uh, uh, And, uh, you know, they ended up staying together again for a while. Um, and you had a pretty good time for a while. She actually was like one of her happiest times of her life, she she said later on. Uh, and then while they were together, eventually um, he, uh, that Ray let her know what he was doing, um, using these things to kind of meet up with these women and take advantage of them and, you know, basically fleecing these women that he, meet, he met through the club for whatever he could get, you know, whatever kind of money he could get. Um, he, he, let, uh, he let Martha know that eventually. And by that time, she was so um, so caught up with him romantically. She was so in love with him that, that it didn't really, I mean, it bothered her, but it, it it didn't, um, you know, it didn't send her running or anything like that. You know, she wasn't going to leave him by that time. She was just too wrapped up with him. So she kind of became his, you know, accomplice in these things. Um, she started posing as his sister when he would go meet other women um, and, and help him out with these things. So the two of them kind of had this this racket going together where they would, you know, pretend that uh, they, they would, they, yeah, they would find women on these clubs and, you know, the, the clubs as part of the description, they would oftentimes they would the the women would include what kind of, you know, what their finances were, basically. So Ray would, of course, target ones that had disclosed, you know, a good amount of money. And uh, those would be the ones he would try to meet. So um, so that's what they did. They went around meeting women uh, all over the place, all kinds of different states, uh, multiple states. Um and, uh, and, you know, it's all, it's all talked about in the book, but, um, but they would do this together. And, and sometimes the women would, um, would kind of start figuring out what's going on, um, and, you know, leave. Um, sometimes they would, uh, end up mysteriously dying, um, these sorts of things. And then, you know, ultimately the way Martha and Ray got caught is, uh, you know, they, they ended up getting together with a woman and um, who had a, had a young child. And after they ended up 
killing uh, killing them. The neighbors became very suspicious and alerted the police to them, and the police came, and, um, you know, they ended up eventually discovering the bodies, and then one thing led to another, and then they figured out that uh, Ray and Martha had probably killed these other people and, and all this sort of thing. So, um, so that was Grand they, Rapids, Michigan, right? Yes, they were in um, – yeah, it was in Michigan when they were uh, with the the woman um, who had the younger child, and uh, that's when they were ended up being apprehended up up in Michigan. So JT, um, I got to let you know, um, I was in Pensacola, Florida during flight training. I'm in New York now, and I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So oh wow, uh, I'm just yeah, yeah. So Al was thinking that I'm related to uh, one of these, right, Al? <laughs> so. But I have a question, though. <laughs> so I have a question, though. Or were you going to say something else? <laughs> no, I was going to say that it's just your, your parents. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, but uh, the question I had read uh, about that, did she uh, kill first, uh, according, let's say, that Mar- uh, Raymond had a, a sexual relationship or something, and so she got upset and she murdered this woman? And that was in New York? Yeah, so before yeah, before they were before they were arrested and taken into custody in Michigan, yeah, they had been in New York and <clears throat> Ray had been involved with a, another woman there that he met through one of the other clubs. Um her name was Janet Fay, uh, there in New York. And they had uh they had got a bunch of money out of Janet Fay. Um Basically, when you kind of when you kind of uh, calculate it, you know, for what it would be worth today, I think they basically got about over sixty thousand dollars from her, um, Ooh, and wow. um, you know, in, in the form of like basically like cashier's checks and, and some cash and things like these things like that. Um, but yeah, so so when they were with Janet um, in New York uh, one night. And, and again, this is where it really comes in, where there's all these different versions of exactly what happened. But um, but that that particular night, it would have been the night of January 3rd, 1949, um, Janet was was killed. Um, the three of them were staying at Ray and Martha's apartment, and uh, during the overnight hours, you know, early morning hours, um, they ended up murdering Janet, and. Who actually killed her and how is one of these murky kind of things. There's different stories. There's, there's one version uh, that, that you mentioned where Martha was jealous about the sexual relationship that may have been going on between Janet and Ray. And so because of that, she murdered Janet. Um, but then, you know, there's other versions where Ray had told uh, Martha earlier that night um, that uh, he had gone down to the car and got retrieved a hammer and brought it back up and, and told Martha that, uh, you know, they're probably going to need it later on, um, you know, indicating that they're going to have to use it on Janet to get rid of her. Um, and, you know, there's a version where Ray essentially tells Martha that if he really loves her, I mean, if she really loves him, Sorry, if Martha really loves Ray, then she'll kill Janet by using the hammer and hitting her in the head with it. And so that's one of the versions of it that uh, that she knocks Janet in the head with the hammer a couple times um, to kill her. Um, and then after after being struck by the hammer, uh, Ray ends up taking a, like a handkerchief and making a you know a, a, a a noose out of it, for lack of a better word, and, and strangling her with it um, to kind of finish her off. Um, and you know, there was testimony at at trial from the um, the doctors that you know, did the autopsy on Jesus' body about what really caused her death. And um, the testimony was that either one of these two events could have killed her. You know, the the hitting in the head with a hammer uh, could have killed her eventually, um, but also the strangulation could have killed her as well. Um, so, you know, that was another issue that kind of went into a trial, but, um, so yeah, so these different, these different versions of this event about, you know, who really kind of struck the first blow, so to speak, 
uh, against Janet Fay and, and what exactly happened. So it changed. I think I counted up. There was four or five different versions of it, ultimately. Well, I'm going to make another version here. <laughs> Not really, but here it is. Janet is a nurse, and her job is you know, taking care of people. No history of violence. And here's a guy that has a history of messing with the frontal lobes and also having issues. And then even a, a rumor in Spain that there may have been a <laughs> he may have murdered some. You know that's you know you know questionable, but still sounds to me like uh, Raymond's the one that's uh, pushing the buttons here. Yeah, I mean he certainly seemed to be the, the kind of the dominant part partner of the two, you know, the one that kind of ultimately controlled everything, because you know, it seems like Janet became so wrapped up with him, so intrigued with him, so in love with him that she would basically do whatever he wanted her to. And, you know, she testified to that at trial at different times as well, saying, you know, you know, if, if, if Ray told me to stop breathing, I would do it. You know, that's how much I loved him. Um, so you know you have to you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt and think well you know she's trying to save herself too so is she saying this to you know kind of as an excuse for what she did um, trying to you know to to lessen her own responsibility her own culpability for the, for the crimes um, or is it you know 100% accurate um, you know certainly it looks like she was definitely very much um, attached to him and, and, and definitely definitely very much influenced by him and would certainly want to make him happy and, you know, appease him and all that sort of thing. So, um, so question like said, on, uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, when uh, they killed, what is that, uh, uh, Delphine Downing? Uh, how yeah. did they get caught? How did they get caught? So, well, after they killed her... Um, her her young daughter was still alive. Um, she was about two or three years old, um, and they were trying to figure out what to do with the daughter. Uh, and they ultimately decided they they couldn't really keep her around. Um, it would be too hard to try to explain, you know, why they had her and all that sort of thing. So, so the what purportedly what happened was Ray told Martha they needed to get rid of her. So he kind of assigned that task to her and said, you know, I don't. Really care how you do it, but you need to get rid of her. So Martha, um, apparently Martha took uh, the little the little girl um, down in the basement and ended up drowning her um, in uh, in you know kind of make it even more disturbing. He, he drowned the water he used to drown her in um, was actually water that had that had filled up that had been filling up the hole that Ray had dug to bury the mother in um, when they were, you know, digging the hole to hide her body in. Um, this is water they had bailed out of it. So she ended up, um, this water was in this tub, and she ended up drowning the, the little girl in it. Um, so having killed both of them and uh, hiding the bodies uh, in the basement there, you know, they, they put them in the hole and uh, put her back on it and then, you know, covered it with, Fresh cement, you know, to make it look, try to make it look like it was, you know, nothing other than the basement floor or whatnot. But um, after they had done this, um, they they would like went out to the movies, uh, went into town and went to the movies that night. And then oh, really? they got back. Home, yeah, and then when they got back home from the movies, shortly after they got there, there was a knock at the door, and it was the police, you know, the local police there in Michigan. And what had happened is the neighbors. Delphine's neighbors had been very suspicious. Um, they, you know, they'd been kind of suspicious from the beginning when, when they first heard about uh, Delphine getting together with with Raymond and kind of what was going on and how fast the relationship was developing and things. And they'd been concerned and things. And then when she went missing, of course, they became even more concerned. So they called the police and asked the police just to go out and, you know, basically do a welfare check. Um, Delphine there, and so the the police showed up. They knock on the door, and you know Ray answers it, and um, they ask him, "Well, you know, where's Delphine?" And you know he tells them, "Oh, she had to she had to go visit her relatives. It was like an emergency. She had to she had to go." And you know, well, where's the little girl? Oh, she took her with her um, as well. And we're just here 
basically house sitting, you know, just watching the house with them while they're gone. And uh, they're like, okay, well, can we come in and, you know, check the house? And he's like, sure. And so, you know, they, they come inside and eventually they, they, you know, they go down in the, in the basement and they see this fresh cement there. And of course, you know, that kind of gets their attention and you know, they eventually end up finding the, the bodies there. And uh, including the, the little girl who, who apparently her body was still warm, um, you know, because it hadn't been that long since she'd been killed. Wow. So they found the body and, of course, arrested them. Um, and that's how the, that's, so that's how they were taken into custody. And then, you know, they eventually ended up confessing to murdering Janet Bay in New York as well. And that's actually that's actually the case that they went to trial on was the Janet Bay uh, murder in New York. So they were they were arrested in Michigan for the for the Downing murders, um, but Michigan at the time did not have the death penalty. Um, oh, okay. I don't know, they, they they might still not. I'm not exactly sure on that, but um, certainly at the time they did not have it, and uh, New York did. So um, there was kind of an agreement that was reached between the you know the two states and the two governors, and they were extradited to New York um, for trial there. And so that's where they. They went to trial for the for the Janet Bay murder there. And uh, then one question is: uh, I noticed was there there seventeen murders they may have been attributed to, or is that uh, just hypothetical, or is this? Yeah, I yeah, I mean, putting a, an exact figure on it is pretty difficult. I know they were suspected in quite a few, um, you know, around the country. Um, you know the ones we can say for sure. We can say for sure the two, uh, the two in Michigan. Um, we can definitely say the Janet Bay in New York. Uh, we can definitely, we can definitely point uh, and raise a big red flag to the woman in Spain um, with Ray. Of course, that was before he met Martha. Um, there was another woman. There was a woman from uh, Arkansas who um, who they fleeced together. Uh, drugged and put her on her bus, um, you know, sending her back where she came from. And um, she was found on the bus and uh, in, a, in a really bad state and ended up dying, um, you know, not long after that, within a few days, I think it was. Um, and uh, there's certainly a big red flag with that one. Um, and um, those for sure... And uh, the other, you know, some other possibilities around, but you know, they didn't, they didn't tie them definitively to any of the other ones. So the, uh, like, when you look at the all the various serial offender motives, and I and I've noticed that a lot of your books that you do have uh, sadosexual serial killers that you've done. These, this couple seems to me that their agenda wasn't to kill; it was to uh, get the money, and then. One of the the mo is to kill so they don't get caught or something to the effect. Or would you think that there was more? There was an interest in kill as well. Yeah, I think this one. Yeah, exactly like you said. I, I think this one. It wasn't so much the the thrill of the kill. Uh, it was more um, just to just as a, as kind of a means to an end. You know, as to to help them get right, money right. and then. They needed to to get rid of the, the the witnesses and things. So, yeah, it, it was more to to kind of help facilitate the you know the what they were more wanting to do, which was you know get the money from these these women, exploit them, take them for whatever they could, and you know if if need be as part of that, if they had to kill them, then you know so be it. That still shows extreme lack of remorse right there. So. Oh yeah, and you know I mean. Killing a two or three year old little girl. I mean, that's uh, you know, it, it takes a certain kind of person to do that. So, you know, we we talked about Ray and the fact that he had this frontal lobe injury. Um, so, you know, for him to do it, that's you know, maybe that's one thing you could kind of explain that away. But if if Martha really did drown her, um, then um, you know, how do you explain that? I mean, that's uh, that's a pretty strong. That's a pretty um, pretty powerful influence that Ray would have over her. So That's true. Yeah. Get to do something like that. So. You know, so let's say, for example, Ray, like many serial offenders, they have almost an inability to uh, show have feel remorse. But Martha, she must have been repressing like crazy. If she just had a normal 
uh, ability to remorse, and then had you know this is really you know that Raymond really mess with her emotionally. There's a, I mean, it, that's a, you're just like you said, that's a different kind of, uh, I mean, it's more of a normal kind of response. I mean, in a weird way <laughs> than having, not having remorse. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm trying to remember, I mean, I think there was, um, you know, after she was, after she was in custody when the, you know, the, the psychiatrist for the state examined her, uh, I think one of the things that they, they found was that her, her emotional, development um had had stopped at a you know a pretty young age i think when she was like eight or nine years old basically they, they thought her emotional growth had stopped so oh that okay. might be, the that, might have, that might be part of the explanation yeah you know based on the things that had happened to her um right what happened in the trial then how did the trial go so the trial i found the trial really interesting too um because what happened to the trial they both Ray and Martha, you know, they're both on trial for murder. Um, and they both had the same attorney, which is very interesting because that's, I mean, that's, there's no way something like that would happen now. I mean, it just, it just, there's, there's too much of a potential of conflict of interest in this sort of thing. There's just no way that you would have two people on trial for murder with the same um, lawyer representing them. So the same attorney represented the both of them at trial, um, despite the fact that, uh, that that they're both um, trying to get you know, you know trying so they're both trying to avoid a, a guilty um, verdict on Janet Faye's murder. Um, Ray's defense basically being um, well, they both started out with uh, with insanity pleas um, as, as their defenses. Um, but then, as the trial went on later on in the trial, actually the uh, the uh, attorney ended up withdrawing the insanity plea um, for Ray. Um, kept it kept it there for Martha, but, but withdrew it for Ray. Uh, but so they're both at trial, and they're both they both testified at trial, um, which is also interesting because that doesn't always happen um, in murder trials as well. You know the the, the the accused doesn't always testify because there's just so much bad that can come out of that for the defense. Um, but in this case, they both testified uh, at the trial. And, um, you know, they had different versions of events, sometimes contradicting uh, their own prior statements about what happened, um, you know, of the killing. Um, and then also sometimes contradicting each other versions of what happened. Um, so there's definitely this conflict of interest going on uh, at the trial. You know, Ray denied killing Janet Bay um, outright. He just outright denied doing it. Um, he denied planning on killing her. You know, he this, this part about, well, he went down and got the hammer and brought it up and told Martha we may need to use this later and that sort of thing. He completely denied that ever happening. Um, of know, course he uh, did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he basically said there was no reason for him to kill her because he'd already duped her out of all the money, so there was no reason at that point to kill her. Um, and then Martha, um, Martha, her her approach was that she didn't remember what happened, basically, that she had experienced this kind of blackout. Um, and, you know, when she came back to her senses, there was Janet, you know, collapsed, on the on the floor there with blood coming out of her head. And uh, Martha couldn't remember what had happened. She had blacked out and had this amnesic sort of event. Um, so she was trying to avoid responsibility that way by saying, you know, she wasn't, she didn't have the intent to kill her and wasn't in a right state of mind and all that sort of thing. And so, of course, there was, there was a lot of expert testimony back and forth, um, from different psychiatrists uh, for the prosecution and the defense about um, whether or not Martha could have, you know, had the required um, mental state to, to be held criminally responsible for, for murder or not. Um, so that, you know, that went back and forth during the trial. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting that, uh, that uh, later on after after the trial, I mean, 
well, I guess let me step back. So they're both convicted, okay? They're both convicted of first-degree murder. Um, you know, they could have been convicted of lesser crimes, but they're both convicted of first-degree murder. Um, both sentenced to, to death. Um, they both go to Sing Sing Prison, um, which is, you know, another kind of interesting part for me is just because, you know, Sing Sing Prison is this, you know, same, very, very famous, well-known penal institution, right? And, you know, we're basically we're, uh, we're the, you know, the death penalty by um, electric chair really, you know, originated. Um, you know, they had old, old Sparky there and um, a lot of famous um, executions there um, in the electric chair. Hmm. So they both went there. That, that's where, you know, they both served time there before their, uh, before their death sentences were ultimately carried out. Um, and then, you know, kind of after this, after they were, after their executions and some time passed, um, the, one of the medical experts for the defense, uh, one of their psychiatrists there, um, he claimed that, um, that Martha had given him kind of like the ultimate version of what really happened. She had given him like the, the true statement of, of events. Um, and this was something that was, that was put out, as I said, you know, after, you know, after they were both had been killed. Um, but, uh, you know, that, I think that was like the fifth version basically of, of what had happened. So, and he also claimed that he, he, he took what she wrote and, um, showed Ray it and Ray had confirmed that that was the truth. Um, but that, uh, that, you know, he wasn't going to. He wasn't going to admit that to, to anybody, you know, other than his own defense um, medical expert, basically. So, uh, so yeah, so all these different versions of it. So, you know, which one's which one's really the truth? The truth, you know, probably will never really know. But um, you know, all, all you know for sure is, is that you know these, these women died, in particular Janet Fay. You know, she, she died this uh, this brutal death, and um, you know. Both Ray and Martha were there at the time it happened, and they both, you know, benefited from it, and, and um, both tried to get away right. with it. Uh, yeah, I do. I uh, it's uh, it's jthunter.org. Um, it's not .com. It's .org. I, I couldn't get the .com at the time, so I just went with the dot, the dot .org. So it's jthunter.org. Um, um, I'm on a- all my stuff's on Amazon, including this. Um, so if you just go on Amazon and type in the book title, uh, Tortured with Love, um, or just put in JT Hunter, either one, that'll get you there. I'm also on Twitter, uh, JTH True Crime. I'm on there quite a bit. And also Instagram, JT Hunter TC for True Crime. So you can find me all those places. Perfect. Now, we'll have your book uh, up as well, and we'll put your website in and so that it'll be linked with ours and uh, people listening so it's easy to find, just one click. I, again, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to talk about your new book. Uh, yeah, my Hunter, pleasure, guys. Thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, hope to be on again in the not-too-distant future. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.